So that's really how I wanted to start the talk back, which is how do you feel as an artist walking into spaces like a law school or the United Nations or these otherwise relatively, if I may, serious spaces that have their own ways of being, language, codes. What's the experience as an artist walking into those spaces to deliver a message? Hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. I love it because I think that every audience is different, mm. whether you're in a theater space or in a community center or in an academic setting like this. Um, I think at the end of the day, as a storyteller, and I had, I had to learn this because initially I was so worried about the audience's reaction. Um, all you can do is share your story mm. and hope that it reaches people. So more and more, um, I like testing out my material on different types of audiences because I don't think that it's because you're in an academic setting that people don't, won't you know, appreciate it. I think that they're lovers of art wherever you go. Say yes if you agree. <laughs> yes. Um, because I work in the climate space, um, art, in my opinion, came as a saving grace mm. for the movement to grow. Because what the youth movement was able to do was take this very empirical data, the science, this doom that I, I um, alluded to earlier, and relate it to the human experience, to people, and communicate it in a manner that had not been done before. And, by doing this, create a need for that mm. so that a place like the UN is aware that this, this need needs to be fulfilled and they bring in young people. But also, um, as uh, somebody who entered the activism and international space at a very young age, I was 19, um, art was the thing that I knew how to do innately, that I didn't need to learn. Mm. completely from an institution and um, because of that it was really empowering so uh, today when we have these massive conferences one of the most beautiful vibrant colorful ecstatic life um, pavilion at these major events is the youth <laughs> pavilion it is where uh, ideas are flourishing art is flourishing we have song and dance and poetry and art and it makes the fight worth it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that both of you are in some ways echoing this idea that we have chosen a certain language for the human rights field. Uh, but that language doesn't need to be the language we choose. And so how do you feel that the arts actually shifts human rights practice? You've alluded to it a bit in terms of these ways of being, but do you feel that bringing art into the room shifts the actual practice of human rights and who gets to access it? Yes, in short. Um, in so many different ways. For example, memory can be contained in art. And uh, the climate crisis, is, it's a very paradoxical crisis because you're both against time, but also in it, trying to preserve it. Uh, so it's it's running out at the same time. What is happening is happening so fast that you can't keep up. Mm -hmm. And something like art it preserves preserves memories and um, keeps keeps things alive. Um, on in in terms of the human rights space, I think uh, one of the things that I have learned. Uh, thank you to uh, Earth Rights Advocacy, where I'm. Um, working is that so much of the human rights language, the, the documentation, the legislation is written by people that are not experiencing it. Um, it is written by jurists, judges, uh, these courts so, so far away from the problem. Mm -hmm. And um, one way you can bring in the issues of the people who are experiencing said problem and they can tell you what they want their rights to be is through art and story, specifically children. Mm -hmm. um, children who cannot perhaps articulate 
um, in a in a testimony format in front of a court can draw mm. and they can paint um, and so uh, I think the 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 value that we have uh, just um, to to keep our memory alive through the form of art can definitely uh, aid human rights mm. Mm. yeah I totally agree with that um, and I'd say for example humor plays a very big role I think in opening people up um, to certain stories um, the stories that Baba Segi's wives tell of their lives are really quite tragic and painful you know you're talking about uh, young women being abused in the household, being taken in basically as slaves because they have one, you know, the last wife, she's lost her, her parents, another one being sold off um, essentially because the, her father couldn't afford to pay Baba Segi for the crops. Um, well, he didn't deliver. Um, so these are very serious issues that we're talking about, about abuse, about um, the lack of rights. Um, but I feel that when you... Um, put a humorous element to it, it's less frightening and that perhaps in some way people are more open to listening mm -hmm. um, because they don't feel like you're preaching to them. Um, and I think particularly if you're working within communities, doing advocacy work, I've worked for a long time in comms and advocacy, sometimes it can be very preachy. This is what you must do, this is good, this is bad. Um, but I think you get a lot further if you tell stories Mm -hmm. um, if you tell stories in which people can identify, you know, themselves, their own behaviors, and then create a space for open debate without saying this is what you have to do and this is what you have to think. I think for a long time there's, th there's been this sort of model of working, and I think it still exists, right, where those of us who know come and tell other people how they should live, live their lives, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that's necessarily effective, but if you can parody what's happening, um, then you allow people to draw their own conclusions, and I think that that can be a powerful force for change. And sometimes, you know, you were saying, how does it feel in these settings? You think, well, people think you're being frivolous mm -hmm. because it's funny, um, and all you can do is hope that Yes, they laugh, but that they also get that this is there's a very serious message behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you were performing, I wrote, I, I noticed this. There's this big laugh uh, in the room, and there's this levity of being humorous as this way of being in a sometimes overly serious field. The issues mm -hmm. are so serious. Mm -hmm. The the crises are real, mm -hmm. um, and it seems almost taboo at moments to treat with humor, but necessary. In behavior, we know that an overly serious approach really shuts people down. It's a paralyzing factor mm. in our ability to access our own personal power, our own personal action. The feeling of seriousness or crises in our nervous system leads to this clenching and closing. Whereas you two both mentioned two ways of being. You mentioned humor, and in your remarks, you mentioned being soft. Mm. And I wrote both of those down as you were performing because I thought those are two ways of being that the arts invites into the room. Can we invite this feeling of being soft? And then it doesn't matter if you're an artist or not, that way of being is available to everyone in the room. And we're all artists anyways, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I think yeah. everyone has an artist in their spirit, in their mind, in their body, it just depends on how much you embrace and practice it. But um, that, that sense of inviting ways of being in the room, so being soft, being funny. Are there other ways of being that you've kind of seen change a room when you can invite um, a feeling with you as someone who's kind of a messenger bringing a piece of entertainment? Mm. I mean, I've seen some amazing performances. There's just, um, I've seen spoken word poets who have a stack of pages and they start ripping them out, but you can see that they are just so fully present in the message that they are giving. I think it's that, right? Because it's an incredibly vulnerable place to be um, on a stage, whether you're giving a speech, whether you're reciting poetry, whether you're performing, I think that it never gets any easier. Yeah. Um, the first time I got on stage was really by accident. I started a project trying to collect traditional African folk tales. 
um, and I was at a conference, and whilst on stage talking about the project, the woman said, and now she's going to tell us a story. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not a storyteller. But then I realized that if I was serious about preserving oral culture, this whole idea of going back to move forward, and for me it's about that, preserving oral culture, but then using um, that tradition as a way to reach people but with contemporary messages and messages that are relevant today. Mm. Um, yeah, I realized that, that I had to also embody that. And it's not a, a natural process. We're all artists, and, but we're all very scared as well. I mean, I've never done anything in theater. I never thought I would. But I just realized when I started doing it how much more powerful it was in terms of reaching people. Um, and I think that I've just seen so many different performers and so many different forms of art that have really captivated me. Mm. Um, and I think one thing I'd like to add is I think art also um, creates a space for nuance. Um, the devil is in the detail, as they say. Um, and it's those little details about people's lives or certain words that you might use in your poetry and certain metaphors and juxtapositions, all this play with language mm. allows us to have multiple meanings. Um, and for example, in the case of the wives, yes, their lives are tragic, but they, are, they have agency. Mm. And so many times when we're talking about issues around rights, we remove people's agency from it. So when they speak in their own voices, you suddenly realize that they can have tragic situations, but it doesn't mean they don't laugh, that they're not jealous, that they're not human. I mm. think it's preserving that humanity. Mm. 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 Um, I think I'm going to speak from a completely different juxtaposition because... Um, as, a, as a young person entering very technical, very uh, sterile and almost um, non-human spaces, um, not only is laughter not present, grief isn't present. Mm. And in regards to the climate crisis, um, so much was... Uh, one side was it that the agency of the young people that are being affected was, is completely removed in international negotiations, but another is the human element is so removed. Um, a person sits on a stage and passes a resolution that affects hundreds of millions of people in, in, a, in a matter of minutes. And uh, countries give submissions in matters of minutes, and they negotiate and they debate. And what they're debating is entire lives. Mm -hmm. It's it's livelihoods. It's um, whether a community will go extinct or not. With one flick of the pen, um, that that is what they're doing. And in space like that, grief is looked down upon. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. shamed, um, especially for. Uh, young women and young activists, it's made something that is so emotional and uh, non-rational and uh, an effort to devalue the emotions that people are feeling. And so I was initially very scared of a room of silence. Mm -hmm. But through this work, through channeling the the emotion, I was also able to bring grief into places that need to mourn. Mm -hmm. I think so many of us in our daily lives, and those who experience pain can mourn, but the systems that need to mourn are not doing mm -hmm. it. Um, uh, whether it, that's at the UN level, whether it's at the government level, whether it's, it's at the policy level, and um, I used to think that I was a killjoy. That's how I introduced myself as a killjoy um, because uh, tears can be brought when you bring stories forth. But I realized the power of a killjoy in a space that is ignoring the issue at hand. And if you can get people who have so um, removed themselves from the human element, the animal element, the living being element of an issue and remind them that they too are temporary in this grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. then uh, that, can, that can change things, that can change policy. 
So oftentimes my colleagues and I, yes, we go um, to advocate, but we also are in the business of touching people's hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's, I think that's a kind of emotion that is also needed and it should be brought in. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I want us to, to touch on this both very personal and philosophical question, which is the line between art and activism, or art and advocacy. And we were talking a bit about it before the session that um, art can be deeply personal. Mm. I, one of the things that I'm exploring in the fellowship here with NYU in regenerative design is the concept of decomposition as a social process. You know, how do we decompose systems? How do we decompose our own beliefs that we were built with? How do we decompose our habits and our identity and all these things that are imbued in the way that we are in the world that we need to allow to die in order to be in this new way of being, whether it's systems we want to change or the actual human rights practice field itself. And I remember writing a paper for the More Than Human Rights Gathering last year, and it sounded so clinical. <laughs> Carlos Sanders will tell you it's true. <laughs> And I had been writing these personal poems on the side, and I hadn't read any of them to anyone, not even my partner, not my mom, not my sister, because it had set what felt to me so personal. I felt like I'd be exposing myself mm. if anyone read these poems. I'd be like, they can't know. <laughs> you know? They can't know that these, whether it's feelings of shame I have about my own families or social histories past, whether it's feeling things that I know inside of me are in a process of transformation and change that are my work as I also navigate this field in which we're trying to guide bodies of people and place through the larger work, right? And that feels like a lot. It feels mm. so vulnerable and personal. And art feels like sometimes the personal space you get to go to to work it out. Mm -hmm. But then when you cross that that precipice, that boundary of sharing it. And then it becomes a message that other folks can talk with or mm -hmm. connect with. Maybe it also reflects that mirror of needing to be seen back in you, the artist, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how do you, what, in your opinion, what is the line between art and activism? And when does one thing become the other for you? Is it palpable and visible inside of how you feel? Or does it kind of happen accidentally? Yeah. <laughs> I can go. Um, <laughs> I've never self-proclaimed myself as a poet or a writer because I always thought that is a, that is a title somebody else gives to you. Mm. Um, and then I got this really interesting advice um, when I did take formal office in the UN. And, there were, and my friend, my colleague said, you can't be the poet in the room. In, in that space, you need to rebrand. You need to pick a, a niche, choose between climate finance, loss and damage, uh, human rights, choose your thing, because the poet in the room has no uh, like material standing. Mm. And um, I took that advice seriously because this was a this is an economist that I trusted. And um, over the course of time, started manipulating who I am into a very technical person. And I do have that ability. It's not like I don't. But in that process, I was slowly killing the essence mm. of what makes me me. Um, because in the climate negotiations, had I seen a young woman address heads of state in a manner of, uh, of poetry that brought tears to their eyes, I would have been motivated to do that, like, if I had seen that, but that doesn't happen. Um, and um, what I also did lose was a is a way of communicating to myself. Because at least in the climate space, a lot of hope and expectation and resilience and this paradox of like, 
both being brave but also vulnerable is put on young people and young women in particular. Mm. And poetry had always been something I would console myself with. Mm. People often ask, where do you get your hope? I don't have it. Mm. The, the answer is in a, in a, in a massive uh, issue that we're in, hope is one has to cultivate it. Mm. And the way I cultivated it was writing and telling myself you can find your way back. And um, that is a long way of saying art is activism. It keeps people um, like myself alive. And only recently have I been able to go back to, to, to this poetry. But um, the places of, of power, of um, policy, of the world regime seem to time and time again reject this as almost a fickle, useless, I mean, like um, a thing. Um, when one can argue that their theories are also as as fickle as as um, as what they can get, and um, yeah, I I think art and activism is the same thing. It's it's calling out to people, um, trying to connect with them, and the artist's responsibility is the same as an activist's responsibility. It's to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And whether you do it through humor or grief or softness or hardship, you are trying to bring the truth forward. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's just inseparable, um, sort of the personal and the political, the art and the activism. I remember actually quite young, maybe I was 14, 15 years old, and being in a French literature class, and they were talking about la littérature engagée, and you know whether you have engaged literature or art for art's sake. And even at that young age, I didn't understand art for art's sake. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I, I can appreciate beautiful art, um, but for me, it has always been about transmitting a message um, it's kind of like saying, I don't know how to inhabit this world in a body other than my own. I don't know how to have a perspective other than that of a black woman, of a mixed race woman, of an African woman, of a certain age in her 40s. Um, all of that um, experience existence mm. informs the stories that I choose to tell. I just don't believe in, that anything is neutral. Um, mm -hmm. even in terms of the choice of stories that we choose to tell, it says something about our politics. Mm -hmm. um, even if we decided to only, you know, read love poems, for example, it would say something about us. So for me, the two are so, so closely related. A and I agree. I mean, it's just such a powerful weapon. Um, and that's how I, I want to use it. Um, I, 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 I don't know how I would be able to create work that didn't speak to the issues that mattered to me. I wouldn't even be able to do something, I think, on commission that was against my values and my ethics because I just think the two are just so closely interrelated. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear what you're saying, I think particularly with the climate issue earlier I was saying to to Ariel you know is I you know I'm I'm, I'm giving I'm sharing stories about women's lives and somehow sometimes in these spaces it feels like women's rights is passe you know mm. now we need to talk about climate and tech <laughs> <laughs> um it's true you know we don't talk before we spoke only about women's rights and suddenly we don't speak about it anymore mm. um so it's a way to keep things on the agenda but also for me you know the, the, the new work I'm working on is around climate because it's one of those concerns and it's so pressing and it's something that you feel that you're running out of time. Um, and yeah, for me, art, activism, artivism, they're just completely mm. linked. And I see it all over. I mean, when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, and the use of the graffiti artists and the kind of role that they have played, you were talking about naming, um, naming people so that sometimes these spaces are so impersonal. So now we have, um, we're naming those who have been killed, for example. All those things are very important practices to humanize this space and to remind ourselves that we're talking about human lives. Mm. Thank you. Did we receive any cards from the audience? Oh, wonderful.
Oh, gosh, okay. <laughs> Please forgive me if I mess it up. How much distance is there between your personal voice and your performing voices? What is the quality of this distance? That's deep. This is deep. <laughs> Who asked that question? Make it yes. <laughs> Reveal yourself, Shiva. <laughs> Would you like to go first? What is it? For me, there's no distance. <laughs> there really is no distance, and perhaps um, there, there needs to be. Um, well, actually, I know. Like I was saying, the stories that I tell are completely conditioned around the issues that preoccupy me. Um, so there is very little distance. One thing that I will say is that by working on adaptations of texts, for example, of course, I'm not telling my personal story. So that creates a certain distance. And I'm embodying other, the stories of other people. Um, and for me, that works. I don't feel the need necessarily at this moment to tell my own personal story. Uh, who I am comes in through the way I adapt um, these stories, um, but yeah, there is no separation. I think it's a little different for me. Um, it's much more vulnerable because I bring my people mm. with me when I get on stage. Uh, when I talk about names to others, it might just be audio, but in my head I see a picture, um, I see faces, I see a village. Uh, I see my grandmother, my grandfather, and uh, over the course of doing this, it, it's been psychologically difficult because uh, what may look like performance is taking all of the things that one compartmentalizes and puts aside to just function and then going back into the memory so that others can be with you. Um, as you as you tell that story and with poetry it's you have more space because you can be a little bit more cryptic I can hide behind certain lines I can make allusions and references um, but um, for for the activism I do my identity comes with it and it's expected to come mm. with it to a certain extent um, if I don't mention it people will often ask um, if I do mention it uh, people will take it for granted. So it, at times it can feel like there is a trade going on of consumption. Mm. Um, and over the course, I've needed to create a separation. Like I, I, as an, a lot of activists, especially those who are sharing their frontline stories, um, need to do in order to, in order to live our lives is that we cannot dwell in all of the stuff that we're carrying 24 seven. Um, that said, in terms of poetry, writing about it, um, that for me feels like a catharsis. It feels like an exercise. There's so much that I am not ready to even read today, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now, um, uh, when the time passes. But there's the the business of holding people's hands and asking them to invest in a tomorrow while also being very vulnerable um, can be rather difficult. It's true. I want us to just give one more round of applause and thanks to these two remarkable women. <laughs> <laughs>